Hi everyone, welcome back and give a warm welcome to Dragan Gajic and Marko Djuric from Northal. They will be talking about data mesh for the cognitive city. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Dragan Gajic, I'm CTO of Northal and together with me today is my uh, colleague Marko Djuric, data analyst. Uh, we would like to share this story. We have been involved past nine months. Um, this is relatively new thing, so I, I hope you will like it. Okay. Before we start, a bit of uh, uh, our company. Uh, we would like to be defined as a company which is doing digital transformation, founded 20 years ago in Estonia where we started with uh, e-government and digitalizing government services. Then we moved to e-health, Cognitive City, and plenty of other things. We put just a couple of numbers because people like numbers. So this year will be close to 200 million of, of revenue. We have 1,700 people in more than 21 offices around the world. Two of them are in Serbia, in Belgrade, and in Novi Sad as of September, I think, and uh, uh, well, I think that's 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 okay. That's enough. <laughs> so, a bit of agenda. Why data mesh? Data mesh is uh, um, important piece of our data and AI strategy in Nortel, and uh, today we'll be talking about well, for first introducing data mesh as a concept, and then my colleague will take over to tell you what he, we have been doing and a, a bit of demo, of course, only the thing we can actually show because that's kind of, we cannot show everything, okay? Uh, just for my understanding, uh, how many of you are kind of data people, data engineers, uh, data analysts, data scientists? Okay, so, because the others I assume developers and, okay just to know how to explain. Uh, well, I, I would like to start first, uh, they call this traditional data division of operational analytical data. Operational data is what most of you are dealing with. This is the data which is used to run the business and serve the users, CRUDs. This is what developers mostly are doing, okay? And then Typically, we all know there are, there are some reports there and there are some other people, data people dealing with it. And in the middle, you typically have these data pipelines where, you know, e either ETL or ELT or whatsoever. And that, that data, in <coughs> which is used for reporting, collected from many of the other system is uh, referred as analytical data. Okay, so this is the data which is used to optimize the business and uh, to augment user experience with intelligence. Okay. Now, if you take a look historically, how analytical data has evolved. Well, in the beginning, there, there was a data warehouse, right? So uh, dealing with very structured data. So meaning when you do ETL, you know exactly how to transform data. Then, somewhere in 2008, we were start, start to talk about unstructured data, and that's Hadoop. That means, like, just put it everything there and we'll figure out what to do it later, right? Then, cloud happened, so everything become more easy, right? So, I, I recall we, we did one project with a big Hadoop cluster on-prem, like 50 nodes for EdTech and we needed to store data for, let's say, three months. Uh, and then somebody asked, can you do it like for six months? And that was like 10 million invested back, back then. Okay, so with the cloud, everything become more easy in terms of scalability and stuff. In the past, you needed to plan upfront. So then after cloud, we will start to talk about data lakes, right? Lake houses. Um, everything on cloud. You know what's lake house? That's a combination of data warehouse and data lake because they are both have 
advantages, disadvantages, right? Like nothing is perfect solution. But what's common? What didn't change? Well, what didn't change is that we are continuously uh, approaching to analytical data in centralized manner, right? Whether we are talking about traditional data warehouse or data lake or lake house, you collect data from everywhere, you put it on a single place, right? Now, during the time, some challenges were identified. And I can say from a, Nortel is a big company, we have five business locations, all kinds of locations doing big, we are growing also by uh, acquiring other companies. So, you know, whenever you do that, you, you need at least two years to integrate the systems, etc. And then the first thing is, can we trust the data? Data are coming from everywhere, you know, from all sides of the organization, but also from different systems, from cloud, from hybrid environment, etc. So first thing is, you know, with all that mess, can we actually trust the data, you know, especially if you see two reports which show different, which is very common, right? So that, that's, the, that, that's the first challenge. Now, the second one, you know, how number of data sources increase, number of devices generating more data, you know, can this centralized approach scale, you know, is it scalable? Um, this third one may, may not be like that obvious. Um, if you put data on one place, you know, why is the issue to make it accessible? Well, the access rights policies can be so complex and granularity that that's kind of, if you have a lot of data on single place, yeah, you can maybe access it easily, but access with the right rights, that, that's a challenge. So, and of course, at the end, how to effectively manage all that, you know, so. You typically, what you see in companies, and I know whether somebody is this central data team where whole organization, you know, just asking for reports and data and you have that pile of backlog and, you know, but essentially struggling with it because you depend on all other people. You know, if somebody changed something, your pipeline is broken, etc. So just troubleshooting that takes a lot, a lot of time, especially for, for big organizations. So. If you recall operational data, we kind of 10 years ago started to do microservices, right? Which is kind of distributed way of dealing with operational data. Why? Because one of the premises says like microservices are organized around functional boundaries and microservice owns its data, right? So that means you break traditional single domain model uh, into, and, and we did that 10 years ago for, for operational data, but we didn't do it for analytical data, right? So that now imagine <coughs> if you look at this centralized approach I, I, I described, imagine that uh, from each source um, you tie them to do, uh, business domains. And instead of transforming the data, you start working with something called data product, which I will explain. And then combining these data products, you create value. Okay, so this kind of like with microservices um, distribution, this is distribution of data, right? So uh, as you can see, we don't have this central repository. No, data are arranged into data product, products and uh, uh, published um, uh, on, a, on a certain platform, okay? And that's something I will, I will explain on the next slide. So. You can, because most of you are developers, you, you can think of it, of, of data mesh as kind of very similar thing to microservices. Of course, there are four principles which, which apply there. And we start with domain ownership, okay? Because one of the reasons why we have all those, those challenges in big organization with data is that you have this central team but data is generated somewhere else. So this central team don't really understand the semantics of data. So you, you work in IT companies, right? So uh, you can imagine that things like attrition, retention, uh, these, you, you know what's attrition, retention, how many people, that's kind of very common in IT industry, how many, many people are staying or, or, or changing the company dynamics of that data is what people in cultural HR understand because they are tracking also and talent acquisition, sorry. 
Uh, they track the market and they understand the dynamics, you know. So that's just one example. So how to deal with that? Well, similar to microservices, you move ownership of that data from this central team, which is interested in technology, to where it belongs, okay? Now, this, that's first principle. Of course, you will ask me, but these people are not IT, you know, how they will deal with that? Well, we help them with second concept, which is called three data as a product, because in traditional approach, data is the result of code pipelines, right? ETL pipelines. You know, when you run this code, you get the data. But imagine you combine data with the code, which deals with security, with access to the data. In practical terms, the code which exposes data via APIs is part of this data product. That's a data product. That's a, that's a unit in data mesh. Uh, then, as I said, if you do that through the organization in each sector of your company, you say you generate this data, you should be excited about this data, you expose that data as a data product to the rest of the company, and they say, but we, you know, we are not IT. So there is this concept of self-serve data platform where essentially you provide these standard things so you can enable this team to manage the life cycle of data products, okay? So that, that, that's the thing, you need to help them. And now you will tell me, you know, but that's a centralized thing. Well, it's not, it's just thing which helps, but the data remains, for example, in this example of the HR system, in, in companies you have separate HR system, okay? And data is generated there. You simply don't transform it, you know, you make it possible to expose that data in the different ways. And at the end, you might say, okay, everything is nicely distributed all around, but how we assure security, compliance, interoperability. I managed to pronounce that word for success. <laughs> I'm proud of it. That's hard words. <laughs> Thank you. So, and for that, you need to deal with data governance, which is security, accessibility, standards, GDPR, uh, uh, in a federated way, but you also need to automate. So you need to put technology to automate all these kind of things and pack them together um, uh, with data as data as a product, because data as a product should be secure, accessible, compliant, etc. Okay, so these are four principles. I know it's a, a bit abstract, and this is why we have uh, my colleague Marco to uh, explain you that on one example uh, where we are building data mesh from scratch, uh, and that's for the first cognitive city in the world. We cannot mention, but everybody know which one is. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, so yeah, Dragon is uh, Dragon was talking about um, the data mesh principles. And that seems like a perfect fit for our uh, cognitive city. And I can uh, proudly say that uh, myself and my company, uh, we are working on uh, this great um, and one of the kind project that is happening uh, right now. Uh, uh, and that's the world first cognitive uh, city. But first, what is a cognitive city? So uh, it's a next evolution of the, of the smart city. Uh, also, you will see somewhere that they are calling it uh, Smart City 2.0. Uh, it's a city that can uh, observe, measure, predict. It's a human-centric city. And it's also a city that can provide innovative services and solutions in order to unleash the human potential. So all those are like fancy wording, but what does it actually mean? Uh, it means a uh, lot of data. So the background of this is a lot of data, a lot of it, lot, lots of data sources. Uh, data is, uh, is being streamed. There is uh, a lot of, uh, lot of sensors in the city, inside the city and around the city, like millions of sensors and all of that. So in order all of that to work, no traditional data architecture would be compatible. Uh, so that's why I said at the beginning that the data mesh is actually the perfect fit for what we are doing. Uh, 
So uh, going to the architecture slide, uh, here you can see how this uh, data platform uh, uh, that is focused on a data product, how, how that is looking like. So we have the, we have the data. Data has been generating all over the place. It's been stored somewhere in a, in, in a different storage. It's going back and forward, uh, mostly with the with with streams, but also with a, with a batch or you know, any, 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 any kind of uh, uh, data flows. And what's the end game? So what's the point? The point is that uh, the point is the data products. Here in the, in the brackets, you see, uh, you see the, the city's, uh, the, the, the function, uh, uh, the city's function, yeah. So here we are listed only four of them, like energy, like food, sports, construction. Uh, there are many more, uh, but here the data product is being um, uh, built, stored and shared with others. So the point is to build a data product and to expose it to others that others can use it and build another data product on top of it and also expose it and, and so on. So out of all those four sectors, energy, food, sport and construction, uh, actually the construction is only one that is active right now. So the, uh, actually at this moment, uh, lots of construction works are happening in that city. So there are like 30 or thir more than 30,000 uh, workers there. And most of them are wearing some kind of smart, uh, smart devices. So wearable devices that are sending some type of information toward us. There are also machines that are sending telemetry. So there are lot, lots of data is being collected uh, uh, in, in this moment, in this area. And in the center of it is a cognitive CTOS. So we call it cognitive CTOS, but it's actually somewhere where we define the, uh, the model for the, for the data product, but also the place where the data catalog is sitting. I will, I, will repeating, I will be repeating that data catalog a lot in the next slides. So the data catalog is there, but also the data privacy and the data governance. So now, now about the section with the tooling. So in order for all this to work, all the architecture that I show you now, we need the tools. So you can go into two directions when, when you're choosing a tool. Uh, usually when you're starting some, when you're entering some project, uh, it can happen that uh, the tools are already set up. So you're just, you just continue with, with, the, with the existing project. So that's a no brainer. You're just taking the existing technology and, and moving on. You can start from the scratch like we did. So if you're starting from the scratch, but also in that case, you're, you're usually picking some kind of technology that you have uh, that you have like competence within the company. So I'm now speaking from the angle of IT company. So if you have uh, lots of uh, JavaScript developers, you will take that kind of uh, tools, right? You will go into that direction. So if you're building a, a data science uh, a product and most of your data si scientists are, 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 uh, are found with Python, you will go in, uh, into the area of Python, not, not the R. But in our case, uh, we started from the scratch, but we were choosing those tools really uh, carefully. It took us a couple of months to, to choose the best uh, tools for the job. And then we build the competence around those tools. Uh, I don't have much time, so I will, I will speed, it, speed it up a bit. And I will just mention some tools that I think that are important. So starting from the Data Hub uh, as a metadata and, and our data catalog. It's, if you remember in this architecture slides, it's sitting there in the, in the central part of this decentralized structure. So Data Hub as a data catalog. For the API, uh, we have a GraphQL and of course REST API. Privacy and governments is all, also a one thing that is sitting there in the middle of the, of the, of the architecture slide. It's, it's of course also important. The data infrastructure. For the environment, we are using Huawei Cloud and we are using OCI or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So that's the environment. Computation, of course, Spark. Uh, infrastructure as a code, uh, Terraform is, is the ob obvious case. And uh, something that I didn't mention at the, at the before, we only had like one, uh, one rule before we started in, uh, going into the, into the details about the tool. And that's, that's the, the tools needs to be open source. So you, you are seeing here a lot of tools from Apache uh, Foundation. For the integration part, we have the ingest and scheduling. We are using uh, uh, Huawei, Huawei building uh, tools. 
of course, the airflow for analytics and uh, machine learning, also building tools that are that are uh, that are part of Huawei Cloud and Oracle Cloud infrastructure, and for data quality, great expectations. Uh, now it's a part of the live demo. Uh, so what I'm, I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you Data Hub, uh, which is a metadata catalog. So why am I showing you Data Hub? Uh, because it's, a, as you remember, it's a, one of few tools that are sitting there in the in the middle of the architecture. It's it's it has the, its centralized part, and it also has a really nice UI. And it's the tool that like 99% of, the, of these users of the Cognitive City are going to use it actually. So all other tools are, are still running, but somewhere in the background. But if you are a data person of, or if you are a business person, you will start with a, with a data hub. Why? Because there you can discover data, which I'm, I'm going to show you now. And you can also see a data flow. How does it look like? Or data lineage. So now give me a second to switch to the, to the demo part, which is a, always a risky thing. I was reading somewhere that there is like 50% of chance of blue screen happening. Yeah, uh, yeah, just joking. I mean, I'm using Windows, so maybe the percentage is even higher. I hope there are no Microsoft representatives here. Uh, so yeah, this is the data hub. This is the data hub. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has this search, search button like, like a Google, actually. And maybe one point to make uh, before I uh, go uh, deeper into it. So the data hub is not collecting the data, even though it's sitting there in the, in the central part of the data architecture. It's not collecting the data. It's collecting a data about the data or the metadata. I think I used data word in one sentence like 20 times now. But yeah, it's, it's collecting the metadata. So no data is being stored here, no actual data. And it's, easy, uh, it's really easy to ingest a data source, a new data source here. So uh, from the UI, if you click on the ingest, ingest button and create a new data source, you will see here some predefined data sources, but you can also add a custom one. And this is called pool-based uh, ingestion. So there is a pool-based and push-based push data ingestion. Uh, you can imagine that if you have like 50,000 data sources, it's really hard to go to the UI and, and you know, do the pull, up, pull in for all these 50,000 data sources. So our approach is to use a push-based uh, data ingestion mechanism. What, what does it mean? So whoever is uh, owning the data, whoever is data owner, his, his responsibility is to, to, to push the data into our uh, metadata uh, catalog. Here you can see uh, already some data is being ingested here. You can see that there are a couple of data sets. There is a dashboard, charts, pipelines, machine learning model even, and many more. Here I can search, for example, these logging events. And I can see here there is a data set that is called logging events in Hive. It's stored in Hive. If I click on it, I see here the fields. So the names, names, actual names of the fields in a data set. So for example, event name, timestamp, and so on. On the right side, on the right side, I can see who is the data owner of this data set, who is the owner. That's, that's really important for us. And one of the best features of this tool is a lineage part. So if I click, if I click on a lineage button, I can see that this data set has uh, one upstream and five, five downstreams. What does it mean? Clicking here, here on the visualization. So this is the data set that I'm talking about, the one that is in Hive. And from this data set, we are producing two more new data sets, two more new data sets. And they are being produced with the a, with a, with a airflow, with a scheduler, okay? If we go backwards, we see that uh, the logging events is actually created from another uh, data set, which is also in Hive. We can go backwards again, one step. Now we can see that this, uh, this data set from Hive came actually from Hadoop. It's a Hadoop data set. And if you go even further, we can see that uh, everything came actually from the Kafka stream. So that's the data source from Kafka stream to 
to, for example, this data set. And here we can easily see if we change something, for example, here in a data set, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the source file, if you, can, if you modify it or, uh, or if, you, if you delete it, uh, we can see what else is uh, there affected by it. So yeah, that's about the uh, so that that's about the data hub. I will be going back to the to the presentation now. So uh, if you wanna hear more more details, you can visit this website neosmash.com. You have also a QR code there. Uh, what is Neos? Neosmash. Uh, Neosmash is actually that cognitive CTOS, this circle that is sitting in the, in the middle part of the data architecture. So we are calling it um, Neos. And there we are, that, that's our website, and there we are uh, uploading uh, the information about uh, what we did uh, regarding this uh, cognitive city. You can see which technology that we, we are using and so on. So, so yeah. You know, you, you, you can follow it, and you will you will see what's what's happening in uh, in that part of the of the world regarding the cognitive city. Thank you.